So I'm going to do a little, I'm going to read a little bit from each book, okay? So I'm going to start with Italian, because it's the only four lines I've written in Italian. Due piedi nudi, cercando il tramonto, dimenticando del tempo, né ieri né domani. Two naked feet, searching for the sunset, forgetting time, neither yesterday nor tomorrow. And I'm going to read kind of like one piece from each book. Ladies who lunch at Le Benodin prefer oysters no larger than two inches. Briny, muscular, manageable. The most popular are widow's holes. Like a punchline to a dirty joke about the world's favorite aphrodisiac. Instead, it's named for a widow married to a lost at sea whaler who lived on the Peconic, where oysters are born, bred, cultivated to ladylike taste. If left alone, they can live for 15 years, grow to foot long sea creatures, almost inert, inanimate as a plant. Oysters live sealed inside shells, filled with their own liquor. Take one firm bite, or the creature will live on in your stomach, say the French. Puff your cheek with its liquor, taste the salty air, a sweet creature. Slurp, never chew. Tease it, work it with your tongue. Never sink your teeth in goodness, no. Yet others say, if you swallow, all oysters taste the same. And this is sort of my Queensy poem um, from Thieves and the Family. I mean, I have a lot of Queensy poems, so I won't bore you. But this one is a Queensy poem. This actually came out of something called New York Stories. It's a course that Steve Zeitlin from uh, City Lore teaches at Cooper Union. And I was going through like a really uh, bad patch of not writing, so I took this course with me. And this came out of it. Since you asked, I am from dank wine cellars in South Jamaica, from cousins named Johnny, Joey, Nikki, and Frankie, who harvested Queen's grapes. I'm from a line of women sporting artichoke haircuts and pink collars. I'm also from a Carmine Street settlement that lost its address in the last century. I'm from the mind of a man who sent other men to the moon, from a red shingled house that echoed with three languages at once. I'm from a bar in Elise, in Marseille, a meadow in Elise. But most of all, I'm from 116th Drive off Sutphin and Foch Boulevards, a zebra-colored neighborhood where everyone called my grandmother Mama, where cornrows were everywhere, but never in fashion. I'm from tomato and basil plants strung low with rainbow-colored yarns leaning sideways in damp summer soil. I'm from gnarled hands that sew and tailor, iron and wash, cook, and make all the places I come from. Thank you. Um, this is sort of one of my favorite subway poems, but subway poems are becoming hard to do because people aren't talking to each other. They're doing their phones, you know, they're sort of silent. The same. I want to tell the little Chinese women with the loud voices to sit beside each other so they don't shout across the car over my head, shattering my space. I offer my seat to the lady with the short crop perm, red as a rooster's comb, gives me a soup, a toothy grin, an essence of onions and garlic, shakes her head from side to side like a Tai Chi exercise. No, 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 no. As if to say, I may shop in Costco and wear U.S. jeans, a North Face down jacket, but you'll never make me a Westerner. Won't drop my Chinese voice a single decibel to suit you and your Anglo silence on subway cars. 
as if they were chapels or private property. I hear my grandmother's staccato calabrese vowels clang against brick walls in an alleyway in Queens with the same defiance, the same pride, and the same sorrow to be in America. And this is, um, this is a piece actually, this is a title, um, title poem, Amore on Hope Street. Um, my mother-in-law, I was really very fond of her, and um, she was sort of in the beginning of Alzheimer's, and we used to do this thing where I would sleep over once a month and um, go out to dinner with her. So this is how one of the conversations went. Amore on Hope Street. We swivel into wooden captain's chairs at Amores on Hope Street. The music is low, but audible. Frank Sinatra is singing, The Lady is a Tramp. I guess they like Sinatra. Why do you say that, she asks. Because they play him every time we come here. Oh, is it playing now? Yes, but low. Not to bring attention to her diminished hearing. I was thinking a lot about him a few days ago, she says. Really? What made you think of him? Knowing she boycotted Sinatra for his bad politics, his mob ties. Well, you mentioned he was singing, she said. She catches me in a web and warp of time lost. Louis Prima and Keeley Smith scat through, through the Rolatini. We make it to espresso, sipping to Connie Francis's holy hymn of Mama. My mother-in-law looks up. Did Frank Sinatra die? I want to burst out laughing at the silly, senseless exchange that usually starts much earlier with this. Yes, he died. The corners of her mouth turn down. She leans back, her shoulders droop. But not so long ago, I kick myself for not, for not lying. I was always very fond of him, she said. Did he mean a lot to you? Well, yes, he did, as if we're calling an old love affair. Do you know how old I am? Yes, I do. I can't believe how old I am. This was a crazy poem. It kind of came out of a dream. It kind of wrote itself, actually. Bats. At night, I dream of baby bats flitting out of the kitchen, molding. Up a step stool, I climb. I climb. I cry. That's interesting. Okay. Up a step stool, I climb. Fly swatter in hand. Slip it deftly into a crevice to ease one out. The smallest bat skitters back in. I step down on the, to the linoleum floor. The bat reappears, clinging to the ceiling above me, quivering. Pipistrello, the Italian word for bat that sounds like the sounds they make when they fly in black formations over our heads, almost invisible, always audible. I'm relieved when you appear. You look up, silent, arrive at a solution. Your steady hands, solid shoulders, move through the air, gentle and swift. You steer the bat to the window. Let it fly out into the midnight sky. Thank you.